First up is going to be a presentation by Marie Therese Kane on Divestment 101 and how to organize. Marie Therese Kane joined the climate justice movement in 2016 when she founded a fossil fuel divestment campaign at her alma mater, College of the Holy Cross. Since she has organized diverse communities from college students to cattle ranchers around environmental justice and community development issues, mostly serving at, uh, recently serving as an environmental volunteer for the US Peace Corps in Panama. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and spotlight Marie Therese and I'm going to let her get started. Great, thanks so much. Um, hi everyone. Uh, again, I'm Marie Therese. Thanks for the great intro there. Um, and sorry we couldn't hear from Bill, but check out the video later. I'm sure he has exciting things to say to you all. Um, but the topic of our, of our time today is divestment, something that Bill McKibben's been deeply involved in from the beginning. And I um, actually, Bill McKibben is one of the reasons why I first got involved in divestment. Um, this is a book, his own book that he signed for me when I was an undergrad, encouraging me to divest my university, Holy Cross, from fossil fuels. And that kind of gave me a little bit of a nudge um, as a sophomore in college to begin organizing around climate and, and divestment. So it's exciting to be sharing um, the screen with him today. So this is Divestment 101. And so this is kind of like our plan for our time together. Um, basically just kind of wanted to cover how we got here. So climate change in one minute, <laughs> the impossible task, um, and kind of why we're targeting the fossil fuel industry in particular, when climate change is such a, a big kind of widespread and diverse issue, why are we intervening in this particular um, industry? What we can do about it. So kind of what actually is divestment um, and why it's a tool for the change that we want to make. And then kind of where you can fit in, um, talking about campus campaigns, organizing, and how you can plug in. And then Gracie from Divest Ed will be talking more about how you can get involved locally. So that's kind of the plan for today. Um, before I move on too far forward, I just want to kind of name that we're celebrating Earth Day um, in the middle of, of a pandemic. And I think that, well, there's been a lot written about kind of the overlap between these crises I kind of foresee that this can be something that your, your schools could use as an excuse um, to maybe postpone climate action on campus or in light of other priorities, kind of saying that we need to wait until things return to quote normal or things kind of calm down and then we can start working on other concerns. But I think both COVID and climate change reveal a lot of the same vulnerabilities in our, in our systems and, and their impacts are, are also compounded in, in poor communities and minority communities. And so, I think that as a movement, we really have to, to work on collaborating with, with response and policy efforts in terms of coronavirus because um, we're really all working towards the same, the same things here. So um, how did we get here? I, I assume that climate change is something that many of you are familiar with given that you're tuning into the live stream. Um, but just kind of to review, um, this is Keeling's curve, which is a pretty famous graph that basically is like the story of climate change in, in a picture um, in one sense. This just shows that over time, um, especially in the most recent decades, but beginning with the industrial revolution about 200 years ago, um, human beings have been increasing the concentration of, of greenhouse gases, here you can see carbon dioxide, in our Earth's atmosphere. And this is kind of the root cause um, behind, behind climate changes that we're seeing. So extreme flooding, drought, um, more extreme weather, global temperatures rising, sea rise, all these things. Um, and this is caused by a lot of different things, um, you know, deforestation, land use, um, but also predominantly the, the burning of greenhouse gases, notably um, by fossil fuel companies. And this kind of shows these emissions are not equally distributed. So um, the developed, quote, developed world, the United States, Europe, um, is more responsible for these emissions than, than some countries, and that the majority of the world's population actually did very little to, to contribute to this problem. But those populations in places like Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, island nations are going to be hit the soonest and the hardest from these impacts that they didn't really have a lot um, to do with in the cause of. So just kind of a note on climate justice, where those emissions are coming from. And something to consider, given that uh, a lot of us are, are students in, in the United States and kind of to, to ask ourselves, what is our responsibility, given our country's um, responsibility for the crisis? Um, so again, the UN um, has told us that in order to prevent the most catastrophic climate scenarios, um, we have to prevent global warming and climate change to 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius, kind of depending on the different reports. Um, 
and that would mean curbing those emissions pretty sharply. Um, the problem with getting that under control, as you can see from moving from that dark red line to one of the lighter trajectories, um, which would decrease our emissions, is that global fossil fuel industry has more than five times the amount of reserves of fossil fuels in their possession um, than, than the UN says is safe to burn. Um, the math behind that, kind of what that means is that 80% of fossil fuel reserves um, that are known, discovered, maybe they're not extracted yet, but they're in possession, um, need to stay in the ground in order to prevent um, runaway climate change, the worst climate change scenarios. That's kind of not including already baked in climate change that we've already kind of are going to see based on different feedback loops and, um, and things like that. Um, so that's kind of an, uh, an unfortunate statistic there. Um, and so this is a main reason why, um, why these companies are a part of the problem. If, if your whole business model is dependent on being able to extract, burn, and sell those reserves, and also dependent on other people needing to do the same, needing to continue consuming and, and burning and driving cars, then you're not gonna be super happy with people taking climate change seriously, um, right? So that's kind of one reason why these companies are where we're, we're gonna focus on. So I'm just gonna highlight briefly a couple of the reasons why why the industry is is so horrible um it's not really a secret um but basically from from every step of its of its um sort of production cycle fossil fuels are are contaminating our dirty so here we have from extraction at at this pace of um, mountaintop removal um process we're, we're destroying landscapes we're displacing people likely in the burning phase this is the coal fired power plant um we're producing toxic emissions um contaminating air quality and then the impacts of, of these operations on both human communities, but also the natural world is pretty devastating. Um, and companies don't really take responsibility for their impacts at any of these stages. And, and these um, costs, these environmental costs, aren't really fa aren't factored in um, when we think about the price of oil or, or the price of you know, a gallon of gas. So another thing is that if 80% of those reserves are gonna have to stay in the ground, right? that's like two trillion dollars worth of money that that those companies are going to have to write off as a net loss um and so they're not going to be too happy about that so what did these companies do um there are studies that show that exxon Mobil knew about climate change you know pretty much before anybody back in the 1970s um they had their own group of climate scientists um and they knew about climate change and then because of that because it was a threat to their bottom line um they launched huge public relations campaigns um to deceive the public um, we're going to hear more about this later tonight, I think, in the seven to eight session, so tune in. Um, but basically, um, they knew climate change was a threat, and they denied it for decades. Um, 40 years of really targeted political advocacy trying to shed doubt on climate change, because if you think about it, kind of um, uncertainty, I guess, is, is the friend of inaction. If we're not sure, then we can't really do anything about this problem. We have to kind of keep researching, keep delaying. Um, keep discussing and that's what's really happened for the last, you know, several decades. We lost a lot of time. Um, and so while a lot of this lobbying and kind of education was done directly by the companies, it was also through think tanks that they fund, things like the American Enterprise Institute, the Heritage Foundation, Cato, um, Ayn Rand, I don't know if these names are familiar, but um, these are all largely funded by big oil, um, by big energy, um, not to mention um, the Cook brothers. <laughs> Um, and so the problem is that these companies are not just really destructive companies, like with bad business practices, they're also like rogue political actors um, in our democracy at, at a global level, but especially in the United States. Um, so energy giants spent a billion dollars in the last couple of years since the Paris Accords trying to promote more incremental piecemeal climate legislation. Again, just delay, delay, delay. Um, 360 million almost in the 2017 to 18 campaign cycle alone. That's the same amount that was spent in the whole 113th Congress um, in 2013 to 2014. So they're really increasing their, the money they're, they're pumping into our government um, over time. And it's working. I mean, they have a great return on investment. If you look at the numbers here, for every $1 they spend, you know, lobbying a congressperson, they're getting $119 back in subsidies to support their business, to up their business. Um, which is a lot more than is spent on education, um, than, we're, than we're subsidizing education. So um, if you think about it, it's a pretty good model. And 
um, the problem is that on the environmental side of things, we don't have that same purchasing power um, in, in money, you know? So they're outspending environmental groups 10 to one, outspending renewables 13 to one. Um, we can't really out, outspend these companies. Um, so how are we gonna tackle them? Again, this is kind of showing you how um, big oil is like a third political party in our democracy. This is the money spent um, by, by the Coke network um, in comparison to the two major political parties. Um, so again, that's huge, huge amounts of spending, which carries with it influence. And then finally, uh, I know there was a live stream last night about climate justice, but I just want to touch on it briefly. Um, these practices disproportionately impact frontline communities, communities of color, low income communities, um, because these communities are often taken advantage of because of their, their lack of economic power um, and therefore kind of political um, pull um, and used as, as homes for dirty operations such as power plants, such as pipelines. And here you can see um, they aren't met without resistance, obviously. We have the Dakota Access Pipeline um, right here in the Sioux Territory in the Dakotas, but there are examples from, from across the world um, that show that the frontline communities are both taken advantage of, but also fight back um, against these operations. So basically, um, if you take climate change seriously, you will realize that there is no place for these companies in, in a safe and livable future, period. Um, and so we have to think about um, how, how we can really tackle their influence um, where it's gonna really hurt the most. We need to address the role of this industry and, and confront it head on um, in a way that we haven't before. Clearly we can't outspend them. Um, clearly negotiating hasn't worked. We can't keep doing this kind of shareholder advocacy um, thinking they're gonna just wanna comply with what, what we want. Um, it's, not, it's not in their interest um, as corporations. So this is where divestment comes in. Um, part two, what is divestment and why is it, it a chance to take on these industries? Um, and something that we can do um, practically on our campuses and, and in our own communities. So um, divestment is something that even I think some people, I again was one of the leaders of the campaign at my college. And I think that even some of us leading the campaign were at times like kind of still confused as to what divestment really was and what we were really trying to achieve. Um, it's something that, is not so much confusing as it is just kind of like vague and maybe has a lot of different moving pieces. So even if you're somebody who, who has worked on this before, you might still need a little bit of a refresher. Um, I'm always learning things about, about what is entailed in this process. Um, but don't be intimidated um, by sort of the financial language or, or climate science, any of this kind of stuff. Um, if you care about this issue, you can still, you can work on it and you're an important part of the movement. This is not something that you need to be like an economist to, to fight for or a climate scientist to fight for, but um, divestment is basically the opposite of an investment. When we invest in something, we give it our money. When we divest from something, we're taking our money away. Um, so it's the removal of, of funds um, of an institution or a person from investments that they find to be morally reprehensible or problematic. Usually there's kind of like an ethical dimension here. It's also called negative screening. So you kind of like screen against um, exposure to a certain industry with your portfolio um, because you have problems with the way that that industry functions. So there's some examples here, tobacco, alcohol, gambling companies, nuclear weapons, um, operations in countries with poor human rights records. Um, but there's kind of like a, almost like an ethical consumption kind of aspect to this in that just as maybe I wouldn't want to buy chocolate that was made with child labor, I wouldn't want to invest in, in oil because of it's threatening our, our planet. Um, but there's also kind of like a larger social political impact that's sought in that I and my choice in trying to encourage others to make similar choices or kind of build a certain political movement or statement um, with, my, with my decision. Um, and so divestment is a tactic for social change. Um, justice is, is the goal, um, climate justice. And this is a tactic that's been used throughout history in different moments to achieve certain um, ends. Most famously during the apartheid era in South Africa, the investment was used by, by activists across the world um, to stigmatize um, the apartheid system, um, taking off in like the 1970s and, and finally in 1990-94, um, that system was slowly dismantled. So um, that's kind of most people's association with, with divestment. Today there's movements um, for divestment from prisons, 
um, and detention centers from um, the Palestinian led freedom movement. They use divestment as a big tactic. And then fossil free, I think, is probably the largest um, one today, but um, definitely not the first um, in, in time. And so um, the premise of fossil fuel divestment is to make it socially unacceptable to support an industry, such a reckless industry, by encouraging institutions to get rid of their stocks, bonds, and investment com uh, funds in these companies. So the goal is to stigmatize them, to make them kind of, to you know, pull off the curtain and reveal them for, for what they are and sort of um, slowly chip away at their social legitimacy. And so a lot of times, you know, you'll hear, hear criticisms of divestment movement saying, well, you know, your school goes and divests from, from Exxon or whatever. And then tomorrow, someone's just going to, someone on the market on the stock exchange is going to pick up those shares. You're not really hurting Exxon's bottom line. Um, however, that kind of, that totally misses, not just kind of misses, the, the logic behind divestment, which is that we're not trying to like, you know, hit Exxon's checkbook. They're not going to be like, oh, you know, University of whatever divested, we should really reconsider our, our operations here. No, um, the point is to take away their social license to operate. Um, you know, they, their, their operations are, are really dependent on, on our consent. Um, they're some of the most powerful, um, you know, companies that's, that have ever existed in, in the world, but they depend on, on their legitimacy in the public eye to really operate. Um, and so, they're propped up by all these institutions, the fossil fuel industry um, in our society, you can see um, military schools, government. So when our media fails to expose the injustices of the industry, when um, our schools invest their money, their endowments, um, their, their literal futures in these companies, um, when you know politicians accept money from them, this is all supporting this, this regime, this power, this sort of belief in reality that this is like a, a necessary part of modern life, that there's no alternative, um, that they're so deeply rooted we can't get rid of them. Um, however, if we can begin to kind of chip away at those pillars, the, th the triangle will fall. On the right here, you can see it's like a, an upside down triangle kind of symbolically is like unstable. Um, again, think about all that subsidy money. Um, how, how profitable would this be if they weren't getting all this support, if they weren't lobbying so hard? Um, and so divestment theory of change kind of challenges the way that we typically think about how change happens. Um, we typically have this kind of like hierarchical view of how, how we accomplish things and, and that power kind of lies at the top. There's all these people who have money and power and, and they kind of like rain down change on us here at the bottom. Um, but divestment kind of says that, no, it's the opposite. Um, so while, while the narratives we often hear are kind of like, um, like Abraham Lincoln abolished slavery or um, the high courts legalized same-sex marriage. The kind of these like big people at the top or institutions decide these things. The investment kind of would, would propose that actually um, the biggest social victories of the you know, past couple centuries have been largely the result of social movements. Um, that the abolitionist movement and, and LGBTQIA movements left decision makers with no choice but to um, make those changes that they wanted to see in society. So, that's kind of our job to to take to the streets to put pressure on these on these institutions to confront their power from a different angle because clearly working on their terms isn't going to work. So, um, a theory of change really just means like your your how um, for how you think you're going to make the change that you want to make. So, the investment's theory of change um, is kind of on the right here, but basically um, we kind of believe our like our our strategy is that if we divest our institutions from fossil fuels, then the industry will be delegitimatized and seen as a force of injustice. Um, you know, this will give us more pause when we think about engaging with them. If we divest, then fossil fuel companies will be weakened politically and thus economically. When they go to lobby Congress people, they won't have the same clout. They won't get the same, same funds funneling into their bank accounts. Um, if we divest, then students will feel empowered to keep fighting for other justice issues. So I've always been a believer that even if, um, even if institutions never divest, it's really important for us to have movements on our campuses like this to kind of train. I was talking with Gracie the other day about like movements are kind of like organizer boot camp for, for college students. Um, I would have never learned about community organizing, climate justice, systemic injustice, um, had I not been involved in divestment. So 
this is a really positive benefit that's coming from these campaigns as well. And we're gonna then be able to take those skills out beyond our campuses and fight for these things um, more broadly. And then finally, if we divest, then other institutions will follow and it will no longer be politically acceptable for politicians to accept campaign contributions. So um, it's this logic can be, can seem vague and that it's hard to like say what the impact of the investment is or to trace the impact. Um, but as you can see kind of on this um, chart on the, on the left side, um, direct financial impacts to companies are only one small piece of this puzzle. Um, and I think that the fact that it's harder to, to prove these impacts doesn't make them any less real um, in that even in the you know, five, six years that I've been working on these issues, I think that the industry has a very different um, reputation in the public eye. And I think that that's uh, in part due to movements like, like the divestment movement um, that also kind of paved the way for the modern climate justice movement. So that's a thought there. Um, and then this kind of goes to show too, this quote from the Shell CEO um, saying that even he acknowledges that um, societal acceptance of the energy system as we have it is disappearing. So um, they're, they are going to have to, if, if they don't fall, they're going to have to at least justify um, even better to us um, their operations. There's also kind of a financial logic to the investment. Well, I said we're not trying to like, you know, hit, hit Exxon and Shell in their checkbooks. Like if we, if, if 80% of these reserves are gonna have to stay in the ground, that's a lot of money that's gonna have to be just like written off as a loss for these companies. Um, and what that means is that currently fossil fuels are then being overvalued by like five times over um, because they're valued based on the assumption that they're gonna be um, extracted and replaced and used. So this is kind of something that you may have heard of called the carbon bubble, but basically the idea that um, fossil fuels are highly overvalued given the fact that their prices don't reflect climate risk. Um, so again, if our institutions, their endowments are supposed to be made and invested in with an eye towards the future, um, not for like a 10 or five year return, like a quick money making kind of scheme, but for literally preserving itself for, for posterity, for an indefinite future, then we of all people should be divesting because these are not gonna be a viable investment in the long term. Um, even if they remain profitable in, in the short term, which a lot of investment officers will tell you, um, like this is not what makes sense um, for us in terms of a long-term investment strategy. It's, it's an irresponsible and unwise investment, um, not to mention an unconscionable one for, um, for mission-based institutions um, like universities that are built for the common good. Again, we talked a little bit about this before with climate justice, but um, a lot of times I think the investment organizers might come off to institutions and, and their boards like kind of a bunch of stubborn tree huggers who are just like shaking their finger at at the man and don't actually model these changes in their own lives or you know are hypocritical um but the reason why we're saying no and why we're rejecting these companies so so harshly is because we want to say yes to an alternative vision um for economic and political life and for our communities so the no to fossil fuels is followed up by a yes to to climate justice and here this quote from from one of these um reports recently um talks about how we need to connect our environmental and our economic crises Climate justice focuses on the root causes of both out of control global capitalism, deeply embedded structural racism, and other inequities, and calls for solutions with center the priorities in the voices of the most impacted communities. Um, so basically to do that, to, to achieve a world of climate justice with, with you know, energy democracy and, um, and more equitable communities, we need to shift the money. Like how are we gonna fund the green transition um, where can we get like huge amounts of capital? Well, I have an idea, you know, there's this huge global industry that needs to be wound down for the sake of our planet. Why not connect these two, these two pieces? And that's kind of also, I think a really compelling argument for divestment. Um, and a really exciting part of working on these movements is that if your institution divests, you then have all this freed up capital that you have to reinvest, right? So you're not gonna, your school's not gonna just like put that in the bank, they're gonna reinvest it in other uh, investment funds and stuff. So um, reinvestment is also a chance for, for your schools or, or groups to like really support local energy democracy, invest in things like uh, environmental or socially responsible governance funds, um, renewable energy, local credit unions or things. Some of those are, 
are more profitable investments than others. So you can negotiate with your institution. But again, if the sake of endowments is more to um, like beat inflation and preserve the institution, maybe you don't need to make as quick of a return and you can see other benefits from investing in those groups. So these are a few different um, values of, of reinvestment um, with respect to the climate movement. But this is like a whole another, another huge field you can look into and that is really of interest to me as well. Um, in terms of financing um, the green transition. So who's divested? Um, it's been fun. Every time I do a presentation like this, I get to update this slide with the, the recent stats. And it's amazing how much it's changed in just a couple of years. But $14.14 trillion, um, that is, an, is massive, has been divested to date in sort of the contemporary movement. Um, and if you look at the pie chart here, you can see that over 15% of that is educational institutions. So I think that's something we really should be proud of. And I think that um, as students, we have, we have a big role to play here. Um, one little note you can see on this speech bubble up here is that um, oftentimes you'll read articles like a news article and it'll say like, Georgetown divests. And in the fine print or in the article, it'll kind of talk about how they divested from direct holdings or from, you know, these different words kind of come up. So um, direct, divestment or direct holdings refers to things that we typically think of as investments like stocks, bonds, um, you're like directly holding a stake in that company. Um, whereas indirect investments means that your school is invested in like a fund, kind of like if you look at this pie chart here on the screen, um, they're invested in a fund, kind of like that, that little donut there, and only a piece of that pie is invested in fossil fuels. So in this case, like say the the bright yellow is fossil fuels, but the other colors are things like, you know, clothing companies or agriculture or pharma. And maybe some of those investments are, are more ethical or they would want to stay in. So to divest from fossil fuels, um, your school is going to have to exit that entire fund and, and potentially, you know, lose out on those other investments in order to, to be really divested. So that's kind of a challenge. That's one of the biggest kind of counter arguments that I think you'll get from your investment managers is that they don't just have like a bunch of stock in Exxon, they can sell tomorrow. Most schools don't have a lot of direct investments. Most portfolios are divested in mutual funds, um, these bigger like yeah, commingled funds they're called, um, and, and therefore they're gonna have to kind of work in a different way to divest. It doesn't mean it's impossible, it is possible. Um, a lot of schools have divested their full endowments from these sorts of funds, um, but it just means that it's gonna be a little bit more work on their part and, and more logistics, but uh, it definitely can be done. And so educational institutions, like what can we do? This is kind of our final part um, here today. So college endowments in the United States um, represent a massive amount of money and, and thereby a massive amount of power, $554 billion. Um, you can see from this chart here um, how that kind of stacks up school, school, um, school to school. Um, Harvard's is um, out of the out of the park there, but as as college students, we have access to a tremendous amount of wealth that puts us in a really unique position to influence that wealth. Um, and furthermore, I think as as tuition paying students, we're kind of in a sense like customers to the endowment. That is partially our money, and and it's our it's our education that 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 money is trying to support, um, and it's our future that that we're going to be living in. Um, that's affected by these investment decisions of today. So I think that we, sometimes, you know, students get pushed back from administration saying like, don't politicize the endowment. You know, this is not something that's like for years to touch when I think really it's quite the opposite um, that the endowment is really there for student needs and for the common good um, and shouldn't be kind of corporatized in a way of trying to get like, I mean, obviously you need to have a profitable endowment to support other things, I mean, financial aid first and foremost, but a lot of other endeavors of institutions. But I think that there's ways we can reconcile both of these of these goods. So the movement started kind of um, back in 2011 at Swarthmore College. Um, and it was actually in response to like a local environmental justice issue. Um, they saw how coal mining was impacting their own local community. So I think that's really cool because a lot of people think of divestment as something that's kind of um, out there kind of like a pie in the sky idea. We're talking about like the atmosphere and like polar bears and it's very vague, but really the movement started, you know, based on a, a group of people's response to a local climate issue. So um, I think that's good encouragement too to root our campaigns in local local causes and 
really make them like, yeah, um, a part of our own communities, um, like fabric of, of activism. Um, and a few of the notable divestment commitments to date, uh, my favorite is the Rockefeller brothers who um, are oil giants made their fortune in oil and then realized that climate change needs to be taken seriously and divested their philanthropic funds. So that's a really big um, symbolic and financial commitment, but um, state pension funds can be divested. The country of Ireland's investment fund is being divested. Um, and again, other commitments. Um, and those ones at the bottom there with coal and coal and tar sands, that's an example of a partial divestment commitment. So they've committed to divesting from this industry. Uh, and maybe those are typically also usually like direct divestments. So maybe they're selling off their coal stocks. I'm not totally sure on those, but just a flag. Uh, again, a tiny bit more campus finance. Um, an endowment is kind of like your school savings funds. So that's what I've been referring to as kind of this chunk of money that we're trying to, to green, to, to get out of fossil fuels, to get into um, more ethical investments. Um, and it's typically in these commingled funds. And it's managed, there's kind of a lot of people who influence the management of this, and it depends a lot on the school. Um, but typically there's, there's a board, your board of trustees, and within that board, there's an investments committee that kind of gives more advice or works more closely with the management of those funds. And then they kind of um, work closely with the investment managers at your school. So there's usually a couple head honchos um, in some building somewhere who work on managing the endowment for the school um, and you know investing it based on the mission, whatever. And then they usually contract out typically, um, this is in my experience at least, um, endowment fund managers who work for other like investment firms that are private. And those are the people who are actually building those like commingled funds and, and really investing the money day to day. Um, but our schools are kind of using them to help manage big chunks of our money. So um, our goal, our kind of target will be different depending on your school, but um, these people are important, but it's also important to note that these people are also heavily influenced by people like your college president, the deans of students, alumni, faculty, students. So while these people might have the ultimate decision-making power, as organizers, our, our goal is to pressure them to make these decisions that we want them to, and that involves mobilizing people to put pressure on them, if that makes sense. A couple of the schools that um, have had campaigns here, hopefully you can add yours to the collage. And again, across all different um, countries and regions in the United States in particular. And then finally, just want to wrap up by saying, kind of what lies ahead if you want to start a campaign. Um, campaigns are a little bit different from student groups, I think, in that um, they kind of exist for a more particular goal. They're designed to bring about a certain result. Um, and so they're kind of more time bound. Like a campaign doesn't need to last for like 40 years if you achieve your goal in, in three. Um, so that you might kind of differ or be a little bit um, more interesting to kind of fit into the landscape of like college student groups because maybe you want to become like an, a registered student organization Maybe you're like a fringe campaign, you know, maybe you're informal. What's your relationship to the school? That's something to consider. Um, and what your campaign looks like on your campus is really going to be a function of your school. Like what's the culture of activism? What's the involvement of alumni? What's the structure of your endowment? Um, you know, how many other justice-like campaigns and groups are there? Um, so again, there's no right or wrong way to do a campaign and there's no one size fits all model. This is kind of an example of how all that can kind of play out um, with a given school, but basically just like a vision that's guiding your work and then more targeted goals, people you're specifically trying to target with your asks um, and always being time bound, always giving deadlines so that you know if that's not met by that point, you can escalate your demands. So how do you start a campaign? Um, it's really not too complicated. Um, I made it up as I went along as a college student. I had very little guidance at first and it turned out okay. Um, so basically the first thing you have to do is just build a strong core team. Um, I remember just getting lunch with a friend after we had a class that talked about divestment and we just started like hypothesizing, like what would this look like on our campus? Who would wanna be involved in this? You know, what professors could we talk to and kind of check off from there. Um, building a base is really important. Um, you don't have to have like 100,000 people coming to every weekly meeting of your campaign. The goal is to have like a small group of committed um, students committed to organizing and then maybe you can have a network that taps into and calls on to like the faith-based justice group or your like Latin student organization um, or different like 
you know, groups on campus that can then come out and show up for you in bigger moments and collaborate, but don't need to be involved in the nitty gritty of your campaign. So um, that kind of is what I mean by a base, who's kind of in your movement, um, and there's varying levels of involvement. Um, a public launch is a great idea to, to build visibility um, and kind of always escalating your the pressure. And this is all from Dive Ed. So um, how to actually get started. Um, again, talk to a couple of friends, connect with Dive Ed and see what resources you can get from them. Um, they have, you know, a lot of things for you and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are so many great campaigns already out there and um, so many resources, even with things like building out your social media or writing a proposal or a petition. Um, there's so much work that's been already done so that you can really focus on, on tailoring it to your own campus. Um, and then, yeah, you can schedule a first like one hour meeting and present kind of information similar to what we talked about today to kind of catch people up to speed and, and feel, feel the room and see what people kind of have interest in. Um, again, maybe your campaign is going to be focused on divestment, like full divestment, top 200 coal, oil and gas companies. Maybe you decide, actually, we just want to see if our board will do more community investment or put some money into these renewable energy projects in our community. So there's lots of different ways you can structure your campaign. And then over the course of a couple of months, you can start to, um, you know, really build your presence and then kind of launch a petition to, again, keep the like, base building and have something to kind of show when you enter into negotiations for, with your board of trustees or your president kind of saying like, this is who supports this, now let's talk. Uh, it's kind of like doing your homework. And so a petition is a good tool for both getting people involved because you're having a reason to reach out to people, like sign our, sign our thing, um, but also because you then have um, like a tangible show of support. Uh, and then, yeah, having an info session too is a good idea. So that's kind of all for now. I don't, I don't want to end on too much of like a happy note because I want everyone to stay angry and, <laughs> and get excited to fight. But I think that this quote is super um, important by Margaret Mead, who's a sociologist, saying that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Um, I think that in the face of things like climate change that are really big issues that are and things like the fossil fuel industry that are even bigger and better, um, it can feel really easy to get overwhelmed or feel powerless. Um, but I think that we really have to have confidence in, in our ability as organizers and in our motivation as students and really take advantage of the opportunities that we have um, at our schools and the access that we have. It's really, really unique and a real privilege. Um, and I think that if we work together, we really can achieve, achieve some really, really productive, really powerful wins. Um, so just wanted to give that encouragement and say to, to keep fighting and not get overwhelmed um, in the face of some of these, these really big issues. That's all for today. Um, my information is here. Um, I'm always happy to support um, your campaigns or your, your questions as I can. Awesome, thank you. Um, so at the, end of, at the end of the live stream, if we have time, we're gonna open it up to Q&A for both Marie Therese and Gracie. Um, but I think you touched upon a couple of really good points, especially um, the process of building these movements and going through it. You know, it might not, your campaign might not always succeed, but what you're doing is you're laying the groundwork for students that might be at your university a couple of years from now, um, different universities in the area who, who are undertaking divestment, they'll see kind of the process that you've gone through and they can learn from, you know, what worked for you, what did not work for you. And that kind of leads us into our live stream tonight where we have local university group um, divestment campaigns are gonna be coming on and sharing their stories. Um, with that, we're gonna turn this over to Gracie Brett. Uh, Gracie is a campus organizer at Divest Ed, the coordination and strategy hub for the fossil fuel divestment movement. She became interested in climate justice when she joined her university's divestment um, campaign, Fossil Free AU. There, Gracie learned the importance of community and camaraderie in organizing. She views the climate crisis as an opportunity to reshape the global political economy to serve people over profits, seeking prosperity for the people, not the polluters. Her work at Better Future Project, uh, Project seeks not only to fight environmental injustice, but to build a more democratic and equitable society along the way. And with that, we're gonna lead into this presentation. Um, Gracie is gonna go through how Divest Ed plays a role in these campaigns. Thank you, um, Marie Therese. That was such a great overview. Um, it was a lot of information. 
Um, so I'll keep my section pretty snappy. Um, so as previously mentioned, I work at Divest Ed. Um, so we support campus campaigns from across the country. Um, so currently that is a lot of campaigns, um, which is really great and exciting. Um, we have about, um, yeah, you can see here, this is a slide that um, has already been uh, reviewed, but um, here are just a few campaigns that are active right now in the movement uh, from all across the country. And if you'll see here, um, this is a map of the campaigns that are active um, currently, and that is actually over 120 campaigns in the United States, uh, which is so huge. And I've said we work with uh, pretty much all of them um, and supporting them. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the national movement. Um, so to help you think about beyond just your individual campaign and what you're doing, what you're plugging into if you decide to get involved in this movement. Um, so really quick, um, this is, hopefully this video works. If not, I can just sh share it with you later. Um, but this is a little video recapping some things that the national movement has done together. Um, so this is about fossil fuel divestment day. So I'll just play it for you so you can see. Yeah, so you can see um, from that video that um, something that the national movement has accomplished together is Fossil Fuel Divestment Day. Um, this was a day of over 50 mobilizations across the country um, and actually kind of extending beyond the country. We do connect with some campaigns internationally. Um, so some campaigns in um, so-called Canada and Nigeria and Kenya also did participate in this day, um, but we're primarily national um, at the moment because um, college campaigns differ a lot based on the, the country, endowments, all of that. The United States higher education system is particularly heinous um, in its organization, so <laughs> we are more geared towards helping towards that. Um, so yeah, all these campaigns took action on their individual campuses, but then they participated and used the branding of Fossil Fuel Divestment Day to show that our movement is united. Um, and so you don't have to fear if you start a campaign, um, you will be supported by the national movement. So that includes um, us at Divest Ed. We are here to be a tool, to coach you, to help y'all. And in addition, you will get support from the greater network. So yeah, you can see here the College Climate Coalition is something um, that has developed recently. Um, this is a group of students that have organized, um, in addition to Fossil Fuel Divestment Day, they are working on a lot of other projects. So students from across the country, some big players are like Penn and Columbia um, and basically everywhere um, are coming together to organize some pretty cool things. Um, and so some of these uh, things that they're organizing are um, forming this national group where we can plan escalations for the future. So moving beyond fossil fuel divestment day, um, we are planning on doing some big mobilizations for Earth Day. As you can tell from the pandemic, that has not exactly played out in the way we wanted. it. Um, but we will be, once we can move back into our campus organizing, we will be um, turning up the heat again. So some things that are going on the national movement actually right after this live stream, if you want to hop on to the national Earth Day live stream, um, our campus national CCC, the um, climate, it's called the College Climate Coalition, um, which are divestment organizers from all these different campaigns. Um, so we worked with them at Divest Ed to put on this programming. Um, so if you tune in at 1.30 today, uh, Eastern time, you'll be able to see this presentation. So this presentation basically talks about divestment. It's only like 23 minutes, um, explains, it ex explains in a more narrative form a lot of what um, has already been covered, but also talks a little bit more about reinvestment and our national movement. So if you're interested, definitely would recommend hopping on to that shortly after this call. Um, so that's an example of one thing that they've done. 
so that's kind of the past of what the movement has done and now gearing into what we're planning on doing. Um, there is something called the Dirty Degree Campaign where we will be doing a social media action because like I said, we cannot organize in person on our campuses. It's a digital action that we're putting together. Um, we're creating the CCC constitution of how we're gonna move forward. How can we make this a democratic and inclusive process when we are trying to divest our universities? Putting on webinars, hopefully uh, post pandemic, put on, putting on a national training convergence to train students from across the country in nonviolent direct action so that they can come back to their campuses and escalate. Um, and we do have plans for greater escalation in our movement, um, meaning that there will be occupations and sit-ins and attend cities and quads, all of that exciting stuff to pressure our universities to divest because we win uh, with student power. Um, at the end of the day, that is the thing that has shown, that has been successful in our movement. Um, I've been around in this role enough to see how different students have successfully gotten victories for their campaigns. Um, and student power is the number one thing that actually turns, uh, turns administrators into doing the right thing, is when their students are keeping them accountable to it. Um, otherwise, I don't, I don't think we would see divestment um, being an effective tactic. And especially close to my heart, um, the campaign, like mentioned, that I started at when I was an undergrad that got me involved in this work, um, at American University, Fossil Free AU. Actually, yesterday, Fossil Free AU was successful and our university divested from fossil fuels, um, which is incredible. So just to hearten you all that, you know, it's a hard fight, but we can win and we do have victories. Um, and especially exciting about that win is that universities sometimes will say, oh, we're divesting for financial reasons, but AU actually divested before the pandemic. Um, they just didn't announce it until Earth Day. So, and they also cited that they did not divest for financial reasons, they divested for political and climate reasons, which is huge because it is now legitimizing our argument that endowments are political and money speaks volumes about what we think um, are the political and moral, um, you know, things that we should be doing. So that is really exciting for our movement. So I would definitely encourage folks to get involved if you aren't already. Um, so to basically like wrap up of how you can get involved in this, um, in the national organizing. So um, to, to basically build on what we've already talked about before, first step is to figure out does your university or your group or your city or whoever it may be, do they have a campaign? Um, so you can go ahead and check at least um, on the campus side if your university already has a campaign by going to our website um, and you can click start a campaign. So I'm dropping that. I'm gonna drop that in the chat. Um, and um, our website is currently striking for a day, but you'll be able to check it out after. So check and see if there is work already happening. If there is not work already happening, you can start a campaign. You can connect with us by um, connecting with DivestEd by filling out our survey and then either me or one of our other campus coaches will reach out to you directly and we will coach you in starting a campaign. Um, if your campaign already exists, you may be from the area and you already have a campus campaign and this may be the first time you're kind of hearing about national movement work because not all campuses in the, in the country are super plugged into the national work. Um, I would encourage you to get involved, and that would mean um, joining the College Climate Coalition on Slack. So you can see on this slide, there is a link to join. Um, and then you can hop right into all the super rad organizing that I've mentioned already. Um, and of course, follow Divest Ed and the College Climate Coalition on social media. You can see our handle right here. And then you can you know, DM whoever, you can stay in the loop. We post all the time what we're doing. It's super easy to get involved. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. If there are any questions, definitely welcome that at that time, or you can just um, like, if you have any other follow-up questions that we don't have time to get to, totally just use the contact information that's been laid out for, for me and uh, Marie Tres. Awesome, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, you know, I just wanna say that if you are a viewer that's not part of a university divestment group or if you're post-grad, um, you know, you could always join or start your own divestment movement in your community. Um, there are countless resources there for you. There are communities that are currently working towards it. Um, later today, we're going to hear from Fossil Free Somerville. 
uh, Somerville at Mass, uh, and they're going to be on to talk about what exactly they've been go going through and what their future looks like. Um, and also, you know, please, please use DivestEd as a resource if you're in university. They're they're a great resource. They've been through it countless times. Um, they'll coach you guys up, and you know, maybe through them you'll be able to commit, um, connect with other university groups that are pushing for divestment in your community. Um, so tonight, uh, first, I think uh, Gwen's going to post this in the chat. We're gonna we have a sign-in form. Um, if you guys have time, feel free to just sign into that, uh, just so we can see who's here, um, where you guys are. Uh, tonight we have another live stream. Uh, not only is it stories of divestment campaigns, we're going to be hearing from uh, Clark. We're going to be hearing from Holy Cross. WPI is going to be actually sharing their letter that they just sent to their board of trustees and they kind of generalized it. So we're going to go through that step by step and see their process. Um, but we're also going to hear from Fossil Free Somerville and we have two speakers coming on from Union of Concerned Scientists who are going to be speaking on uh, the importance of di divestment into the future. Um, and Gwen's also going to post into the chat. We have a slideshow made by Dennis Mahoney of 350 Central Mass. Uh, this is a quick intro on Stop the Money Pipeline, and it also at the end gives you uh, financial institutions, banks to avoid, and you know different um, uh, credit unions and stuff to move your money into in the Worcester community. So uh, I think that's a great resource for people to have. Uh, I think I believe Gwen also uh, posted this slideshow in the chat. I know that's a lot of things coming at you all right now, but. Um, and if you guys need any resources, please feel free to reach out to sunriseworcester at gmail.com. We'd be more than happy to help you in uh, your movement, or if you guys want to be involved with us, just feel free to touch base. Um, and I know we're, we're almost at that hour mark, so I'm going to open it up to Q&A. Um, if anybody has questions, you can either unmute yourself or you can open up the chat and type something in. Uh, questions for Gracie or Marie Therese. Okay, so there's a question. Um, asking for divestment when fossil fuel companies are at an all time low seems kind of insane. How should we acknowledge and incorporate the recent crisis in our demands? How do you think the, co uh, the COVID pandemic will change the timelines for divestment? I think that's a really excellent question that we're facing right now. Um, a lot of our campaigns are facing right now. Um, I think that right now, um, Actually, I've seen some successes in advocating for divestment um, amidst this, this crisis just because stocks are so low and performing so poorly. Um, but also I wanna acknowledge the fact that we are in a pandemic and we shouldn't be insensitive to you know, the political moment and the real sufferings that are happening today, um, which is why I would wanna uplift a lot of the mutual aid stuff that has been mentioned um, by Andrew. I think um, maybe it's not always the best time to advocate just for divestment, our divestment campaigns have actually pivoted on a lot of campuses to doing mutual aid work to support students who have been kicked out of their housing, um, international students, um, poor students, and supporting them. So I think we can have our eye on the prize, our eye on the prize with climate justice, but then also being able to be flexible and shift gears um, to think about like our communities and taking care of each other. Awesome, thank you. Um, we also have a question from Emma. Um, how do we mobilize alumni around divestment, especially when, um, sorry, I'm just gonna, especially when alumni are huge stakeholders and wield a lot of influence at institutions like Holy Cross? I think I can chime in here and then I would love to hear what Gracie has to say about this one, but I think that. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard because there are so many more alumni than there are students oftentimes at school. So it's kind of hard to know where to begin. But I know that at least for for Holy Cross, like that's a huge power block that would really have a lot of influence on getting our school to divest. So I think that a place to begin could be kind of like we do with students, like one on one meetings, reaching out to either prominent alums, alums in sustainability sectors, alums who you think would be uh, empathetic and kind of having them do some of that organizing work along the among the alumni communities to to build power. And then also having like an ask for them. Is it like you're going to withhold donations um, for a certain period of time? Are you going to try to put those 
um, donations into a certain fund that is divested? Are you going to try to have like a day of action? I think making them feel like they really are a part of the movement um, would be something key, but I don't have a lot of experience yet with that. I don't know if Gracie has examples of how other schools, how campaigns at schools have practically done this yet, um, but our campaign didn't quite get to that point um, while I was still there. Um, but I think it's a really key, key part of pressuring our administrators and board. Yeah, totally agree. Um, we have a whole resource about alumni organizing. Luckily, we have a full-time alumni organizer that is working on Harvard alumni um, work right now. They have been super successful. Um, so you can go ahead and check out that resource. I dropped it in the chat um, and would also be happy to talk more about our alumni learnings um, with the Harvard case specifically with anyone that's an alumni that wants to get clued into that kind of stuff. Awesome, thank you both. I just wanna be sensitive to people's time. It is past one o'clock. Um, so thank you both for coming on and presenting today. I think you guys gave a lot of valuable information out to uh, people who might not be in divestment uh, groups at their school or who may want to start their own or join one that's currently happening at their school. So thank you for that. Uh, I also wanna thank um, all the help from the local university students from Clark, Holy Cross, WPI. Um, you guys have been great uh, organizing not only this live stream, but the live streams for all three days. Um, and also a huge shout out to 350 Central Mass. Um, you know, they've been heavily involved in every step of the process. So uh, if you're a post-grad and you're looking to join, or even a grad in, in university, and you're looking to join um, sort of a community group, uh, look into 350 Central Mass. They're a great group of people and they're, they're doing a lot of great work. Um, so again, thank you everybody for tuning in. We do have a live stream tonight. Uh, I think it's going to be fast paced and very exciting. We have a lot of people to speak. Um, and also tomorrow we have a lot of uh, good live streaming on, you know, voting and legislation uh, in the Massachusetts area. We have some local politicians coming on and speaking, great actions being put together. Uh, so it's going to be a very good day tomorrow too as well. So again, thank you everybody for tuning in and I hope to see you all tonight. Thank you. Prom, um, see ya. Thanks, thanks, Sunrise. No problem. Thank you for being on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you were right. It's so like stressful when you don't have control of your screen. Right. I know. Yeah. So I like messed up because I forgot to open up the chat beforehand and I did it between like before both of them. So it was like. Uh, oh, you were fine. I was answering. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't think any. Yeah, no problem. I don't think anything went unanswered. The people got the link to the slideshow. Awesome. Um, a lot of people, I think the way to do it is send the sign in at the beginning and then again at the end because yeah. we had 11 people fill it out after I sent it out the first time and then like three fill it out the second. Okay. Um, did we so get sign up though? Yeah, we did. We had, um, so it was at 18 or was it, at, what was the number before? I don't remember. I don't remember. We have like 31 now, I think 31 oh, responses. Right. So that um, was good. Okay, we did get the McKibben video out. That sucks. I like. I know. I don't know what happened. I don't know I why it didn't work. I think it was like an either or situation. Like either we could have audio or we could have the video. I don't know though because well, you were on yesterday. Were you able to hear the audio from mine? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what happened, and when you played it earlier, I was able to hear it. So I don't know what happened there. Yeah. But that's well, okay. We moved um, through it though, and it, honestly, timing wise, it worked out out better to not have it. But. Agreed. Yeah. No, that was super smooth. Both presenters were really great and they connected yeah. so well to each other. That yeah. was like a really well crafted That's, presentation. Yeah, and I think it flows well with like, okay, now let's see like actual divestment campaigns in the process. So Yes. Yeah, your day like came together. This is so yeah, good. Great. Hopefully you new concerned scientist doesn't take me an hour. They have like thirty six slides or something crazy. I know. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, yeah, but I think the good thing about Zoom calls is that they're really forgiving and that if people want to hop off, they hop off. So cool. All right. Do you need anything right. um, else? What time do you want to hop on tonight? Probably like 
I'm probably going to hop on like an hour early just so I'm like in the room. Okay. I'll probably do you. Um, I, we're still live on Facebook right now. <laughs> nice. That's, <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. I stopped oh, recording.